welcome to today's session. Oh, we've just got the recording happening. So uh, yes, let me let me start again. So yeah, well, welcome to to everybody uh, this afternoon, and for those watching on on the re recording of, of this event. Um, and um, yeah, today's title is all about opening up the conversation about suicide. Um, I'm going to present for approximately forty. 40 minutes, uh, but then open up to uh, questions that uh, any of you may may have. Um, so I suppose just starting my journey and experience, um, I worked in the world of consultancy, training, coaching, and as a corporate speaker for more than 30 years, also worked in senior management during that time in the automotive industry in North America and the UK. And Many of the clients that I work with at that time, you can see on the screen on the slides there. Uh, but in March of 2020, I changed uh, direction completely when I founded the Jordan Legacy a Community Interest Company, uh, very similar to a limited company here in the UK, um, but a non-profit organization where our mission is to engage with businesses and local communities. Uh, to really educate, collaborate, and work toward achieving a zero suicide society. And I think that term is really important to, to reference um, the zero suicide community globally, which is an unregistered body of people who really all have one ambition, and that is that we believe there is only one target that we should be aiming for as far as suicide prevention is concerned, uh, and that is zero. Anything else that is uh, not aiming toward a zero target means we are not being as ambitious as we, we could be. Um, we also are realists and recognise the fact that uh, although most suicides, as we'll talk about, are preventable, not all are. Um, so actually reaching zero will be a continual process for us. Uh, really for as long as we continue to do the work that we do. I um, do appreciate that the material we're talking about today does, does relate to um, sensitive uh, subjects such as suicide and mental health. Uh, we won't be talking about methods of suicide at all, but I do appreciate that some of the conversation may be triggering and uh, I think it's really important that you um, reach out if you need to or if you feel you need to step away from today's presentation that's absolutely fine but um, if you do need to to talk to any of the universities um, or your employers mental health support resources trusted personal contact or as you can see on the screen there the jordanlegacy.com forward slash resources has many help resources on there as well. So I think it's just about a little bit of self care really. Um, my story um, really in terms of the second part of my, my life and founding the Jordan Legacy started on December the 4th of 2019. At that stage, I was working on that day with a client in the Midlands here in the UK. Uh, about to travel some three hours home uh, following a full day's work when I received a, a call that essentially changed my life completely. Now that call came from the girlfriend of my son, who you can see on the screen, Jordan, who at that time was 34, and she'd returned to Jordan's house to discover that he had taken his own life. And as you can probably imagine, everything that I kind of understood about the world and life and everything that I had planned in, in that moment changed uh, really for forever at that stage. To understand Jordan, who is central to, to all the work that we do at the Jordan Legacy, as I say, he was 34 at the time of his death. He had a good sound relationship. He worked uh, as an officer for the Independent Office of Police Conduct in the UK, uh, which investigates um, complaints against the, the police force here. Um, he had a good career. He had his own house. Um, he had networks of friends all around the UK and friends overseas. Um, and a loving family, and uh, as you can see, his beloved little cat, Tabby, in the bottom right-hand corner. In many respects, Jordan was a really high-functioning uh, individual, but in 2015, he was diagnosed with clinical anxiety and depression. Um, the reasons for that are probably complex, as they are in many situations, but to all intents and purposes, Jordan would manage that through antidepressant medication, regular visits to his GP, 
although he wasn't one particularly for talking therapies or counselling of any kind. We knew when Jordan was struggling, uh, when his depression would take more of a hold. But as with many families I've spoken to since, there was no indication as far as we were concerned, certainly at that time, that Jordan had any intent on ending his own life. In hindsight and looking back and with information that we subsequently discovered, those signs were there, um, but we just weren't aware of them. If we look at the reality, as far as suicide is concerned, in the UK, we lose approximately 6,000 people every year to suicide. In Germany, the annual deaths are approximately 9,000. And on a global scale, we lose, according to the World Health Organization, 700,000 people every single year. What's interesting to consider as well, though, is that for each death by suicide, another 20 people will actually make an attempt. Now, this equates to 14 million attempts globally each year to die by suicide. We know here in the UK that suicide is the biggest killer of young people under the age of 35, both men and women. We know that 75% of all deaths by suicide are male. So we lose here in the UK 17 to 18 people every single day. But again, what a lot of people have come to understand is there is this ripple effect um, that in the case of each death by suicide, you'll expect to see another 135 people on average who are going to be impacted directly or indirectly by that death. And I remember when I first heard that figure, that seemed like a lot of people. But when you start to understand that that figure incorporates those first responders, the ambulance and police, those that are first on the scene to maybe neighbours uh, or people close by to the experience at the time, to the family and loved ones, to the extended friends and work colleagues, um, and anyone who has any form of association with that person who has died by suicide, then you can start to understand how quickly we can reach that 135 people. So in the UK, if we lose around about 6,500 people um, to suicide, it means that 810,000 are going to be impacted in one way or another by suicide in any given year. Why do people choose to end their own lives? Now, I'm not a mental health professional uh, or an expert um, at all. Um, I am someone with a lived experience who in the last two and a half years has learned an incredible amount about a world that I didn't understand at all at the time that my son was living with that depression and anxiety. Um, but what we do understand from the many hundreds of people and the researchers and the experts we've spoken to is that the reason why people choose to end their lives is complex. It can be for all kinds of biological, environmental reasons. Um, and it's rarely one particular factor that determines why someone reaches a point of suicidal ideation. What we do know is that it often culminates in a sense of somebody feeling trapped, maybe trapped in their relationship, trapped in their career, their finances, maybe the environment in which they live and work in, or maybe they're experiencing physical ill health, chronic pain, which ultimately all of these can lead to mental pain and torment, which in turn can lead to a sense of hopelessness. And I've had many conversations with people who will verify that that's this kind of situation that they reached when they decided to attempt to end their own lives. And in fact, the quotation that you can see to the right hand side of the screen is taken directly from my own son's suicide note to us. And in that one sentence, Jordan sums up really what we know is the situation for many people who choose to end their own lives. Interestingly, although that paragraph is taken or that sentence from my own son's suicide note, we know that fewer than one third of people actually leave a note explaining why they've decided to end their own lives. We also know that those bereaved by suicide are at a 60% greater risk of ending their own lives because of fears of failure, shame or guilt. 
So once again, this ripple effect of each death by suicide can be significant in so many ways. But I think we need to move forward with hope as well. And one of the things that I've come to learn and our focus really at the Jordan legacy is a fundamental understanding that most suicides are preventable. The experts and those that have attempted to end their own lives, who have shared their experiences, will support the fact that if there is early identification in place of the danger signs and warning signs, if we can spot the signs sooner, if we can intervene much sooner and have conversations with those who are struggling, and there are prevention measures put in place both in our environments and our workplaces and our communities, and there is support for those people who are bereaved by suicide, which often doesn't feature in many of the mental health plans in governments and communities, then if we start to look at those four areas and make sure that those are in place as building blocks, then we know we can save far more lives. So it is, in my view, about opening up the conversation. We know that the majority of people who die by suicide have actually not been in touch with any form of mental health services in the 12 months before their death. 60 to 80 percent of people under 35 will have actually seen their doctor or a mental health service professional in that period, but will not have disclosed suicidal intent. So one of the things we need to look at in terms of opening up the conversation is that we know our mental health professionals and our doctors, particularly, who are often the first place that we would send someone or suggest they speak to, must ask and open up the conversation around suicide. And it's one of the things we firmly believe in, that by having that very open conversation, by asking directly whether someone is considering ending their own lives, you increase the chance of saving a life. We'll talk about some myths around suicide and having that conversation in a little while. Of the 17 people each day who end their own life, we know that 29% of those are in touch with mental health services. And four of those five are actually often assessed as low or no risk. What does that mean? Well, if we're still losing so many people to suicide and yet they're deemed to be at low risk, that means we can't simply rely on clinical risk tools. What we must do is we've got to be prepared to open up the conversation and understand each individual and their particular situation. We know certainly here in the UK that having that conversation and being trained how to have that suicide conversation is something that very few medical doctors or mental health crisis teams are actually trained in. In fact, there is virtually no suicide prevention training for mental health crisis teams or doctors, certainly here in the UK. I think it's important to recognise, coming back to hope, though, that we can all be part of the solution. If, as a society and in our workplaces, we can learn to better understand the impact of poor mental health on ourselves and others, and recognise the signs of poor mental health in ourselves and others, then we can start to um, recognise where a situation is developing where support might be required. But we also need to be prepared, as I mentioned, to have that suicide conversation. And we know that suicide is not an easy conversation to have. We know that it's been a taboo subject for many, many years. Um, we know that it's actually in many countries still considered to be a criminal offence. So being prepared to have that conversation is a really important step forward. And once we understand how to spot the signs and understand more about mental health and these issues, we then got to be able to apply strategies and actions to support ourselves and others. How do we keep ourselves safe? How do we keep somebody else safe? And I know through the Jordan Legacy, a lot of the talks that we deliver um, specifically to companies will be very specifically around how to have this uh, conversation and the need to be really open about that. Now, one of the things the, the Jordan Legacy is involved with is um, research into issues surrounding suicide. In July of this year, we partnered with MEL Research, um, a leading research firm in Birmingham, 
in the United Kingdom. And in that survey of just over 1,500 uh, UK adults aged 18 and above, we asked some really challenging questions around suicide, the kind of questions that are not usually in most mental health surveys. But one of them we, we picked out that wasn't directly related to suicide itself was to ask people, have you experienced a mental health issue within the last 12 months that required support? Quite often you will see statistics that will say one in four or one in five or however many people have experienced a mental health issue. It's not often not quite sure where those statistics are coming from or are they people that have had support or not had support? Um, and we wanted some clarity around this. So with a really good sample audience, we wanted to know, have you needed support for a mental health issue? And as you can see on the screen, the responses that came back said, yes, one in six uh, needed to have some form of, of support for their mental health issue. And when we start to look at the mental health spectrum, and this is certainly not an extensive list on the screen, and see some of the different types of mental health illnesses that may affect people, we can start to understand perhaps why so many people are impacted and experiencing a mental health problem. And going back to the previous slide, but one, I think it's really important again, that we need to understand more about mental health ourselves, um, and how it affects other people to recognize um, the importance of learning skills that will allow us to have conversations to support people. What are the warning signs, for example, that someone might be suicidal? Again, this is not an exhaustive list and, and some suggestions, but we know that anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts will affect us in really four key areas, emotionally, how we respond, our, our lack of self-confidence or self-esteem, the uh, fact that we may be more sensitive to criticism, um, in our language, just using terms such as I've had enough, I can't do this anymore, maybe we become more anxious or nervous. But our thinking process is affected as, as well. And we may start to dwell on the past more frequently. Um, and uh, maybe we start to, to experience a kind of a sen sense of loss in ourselves and who we are, but maybe directly we've experienced a sense of loss that affects us mentally. This low self-esteem and self-loathing very much features of my son's mental health issues. And one of the reasons why we know that is subsequent to Jordan's death, when we were clearing out his, his house and just one of the things we were faced with doing after his suicide, we found a box of belongings in his attic. And within there were journals that Jordan had written. And it was really sad, but, 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 but also interesting to look back over the last four years and see journal entries where he would talk about how much of a failure he thought he was in life, that he hadn't achieved what he thought he should have done in his career. Uh, or maybe he'd not bought the right house or missed an opportunity and was regretting that. And yet he was somebody that the majority of his friends aspired to be, and so did others. Others would look up to him as this good-looking, very successful guy who had everything together, and yet deep inside, Jordan was really had a lot of low self-esteem and, and self-loathing that led ultimately to this sense of, of hopelessness. We know there'll be physical signs as well from sudden weight loss or gain or people just speaking more, more slowly, acting out of character and maybe being very unpredictable. Or maybe there's some very obvious signs such as self-harm or a history of self-harm. I should say that that isn't automatically a prerequisite that someone will go on to end their own life, but it's certainly a warning sign that we need to, to look out for. And... The, one of the signs particularly is, is knowledge that that person has maybe made a previous suicide attempt. From a behavioural point of view, sleep will often be very much uh, affected and significant changes in appetite. Um, language around and behaviour about feeling trapped, maybe avoiding social situation. If you see someone sorting out their life affairs, giving away prized possessions that they've owned, it doesn't obviously mean that 
they're looking at suicide. Maybe they are just having a clear out of things they don't need. But it's maybe a sign that is worth having a conversation about just to check in with that person. You may also notice risky behaviours such as excessive drinking or drug taking or maybe driving too, too fast or other types of risky behaviours. And one of the most interesting ones that, that I've learned in the last two years is a sudden unexplained improvement in mood from someone who has been experiencing depression or anxiety and has been very low. And now this can often be mistaken for somebody suddenly feeling better, particularly if it coincides with the taking of medication, for example. But it could also coincide with the fact that that person has made a decision because they believe they found a solution to take them out of that mental pain and torment that I mentioned before. So always be on the lookout for a sudden change um, or improvement in mood as well. So I've mentioned before that I think we need to open up the conversation about suicide and talk about it more. But why don't we? I think one of the reasons is that there is a stigma uh, around suicide. And until we start to view mental health as we do physical health, and there is some parity, we're not going to have that open conversation. We know that more than 90% of people with a mental health disorder will experience some form of stigma. Um, so why aren't we talking about it uh, more? What, what, what is causing that stigma? Well, again, not an exhaustive list, but some suggestions here. Maybe it is us not understanding mental illness. Maybe we've watched movies or TV dramas that portray people with a mental illness as being dangerous, somebody to avoid. Now, if I believe that's what the world thinks about mental illness and I have a mental health issue, I'm probably less likely to want to tell other people about it in case they judge me in a similar way. We know that different cultural backgrounds have different views in relation to mental illness and particularly suicide, which can often be frowned upon, particularly in some of the Southern Asian communities. And I've spoken to many people in those communities, a young lady who not very long ago at 19 years old told me how she was taking antidepressants um, and her father said, why are you doing that? That's not what we do. And I thought that was really interesting when he said it's not what we do because he wasn't taking the antidepressants, his daughter was, but rather than supporting her, he was concerned about what the community might think and feel. Now, we know that many of these communities are working really hard to change um, the, the cultural issues around taboo subjects such as suicide, but we also know that in some of the um, faiths, such as Islam, for example, that when someone has ended their own lives, it can become very difficult sometimes to arrange a funeral for that person. So again, there's a lot of work to be done. Just feeling that you're different. You know, in, in the UK, each year, a quarter of people in England have some kind of mental illness. Actually, you're not that unique and that different uh, at all, um, but you feel so. Um, and that may be the reason why you choose not to speak up. So it could be your own perception of, and fear about how others might react and respond if they knew. I know of one example Jordan had in a, a few weeks prior to his death, where he was called into his manager's office because a project had not been completed or Jordan's part of the project had not been completed. Um, I know he was really unhappy with that meeting and in fact afterwards had a WhatsApp conversation with a close friend. And that friend said, um, are they aware of the mental health issues? that you have. And Jordan said, well, no, because I there are only one or two people that I've worked closely with who are aware of my mental health issues. And she said, well, I think you should go back. I think you should tell that manager. Um, and as it turned out, actually, the reason for the project not being completed had uh, more to do with the line managers above not completing their part of the project. But Jordan went back and he spoke with the line manager the following morning. And he said, I need to explain to you that I have clinical anxiety and depression and I really wasn't happy with how the meeting went yesterday. And the line manager looked at Jordan and um, thanked him for sharing about his mental health issues and then said, and I need to explain to you why I've just been off work for the last six months. 
So there we are in one organization and one office of some 25 people in that office, a line manager with mental health problems, an employee with mental health problems. Neither of them were aware. We have to open up. We have to have the conversations in our workplaces and communities so that we can support each other. That's really, really important. Maybe stigma is created by language. I was someone who grew up using the term commit suicide. Um, I thought that was the term everyone used. And still today, we will hear it on television and despite some of the media guidelines having changed. And some of you listening now might be thinking, well, why is that an issue? Well, the term commit suicide really refers to the committing of a crime, because up until 1961 in the UK, attempting suicide was actually a criminal act. And in many other countries, it still is illegal to attempt to take your own life. And if you um, do not die by suicide, then you can be, be arrested. Going back many decades and centuries, um, in fact, there were some quite horrific things would happen to your family if you uh, ended your own life by suicide. Fortunately, we've moved on from those dark ages. Um, but the term commit suicide is used in very much the same way as you would use commit murder or commit a crime or commit a robbery. So terms now, preferred terms such as that person died by suicide or they ended their own lives are where most of the guidelines are now going. And it's an education process, isn't it? Even after Jordan's death, I would use commit suicide because I didn't know that that might be an issue for people who've lost loved ones to suicide. So having the suicide conversation is really important. And these next couple of slides are just a very small part of, of a, a longer talk that I deliver on having the conversations. But I think it's really important that if you are ever concerned about someone, it is about assessing the situation and what are the warning signs that are causing you to think this person might be a risk to themselves. I think it's really important to listen always. What is the language that that person's using, such as I've had enough, there's no point anymore, it's it's hopeless, etc. I think if you have any doubt at all that there might be a risk to this person self-harming, I think you seek emergency help and support right away. I think that's absolutely crucial. I think it's important you try and stay as calm as you possibly can and reassure the person that help is available. But you may well be concerned that it might go beyond self-harm and they are possibly considering ending their own life. Now, wherever this conversation might take place, the priority is always going to be their safety and yours, crucially. You may never have been faced with having to ask this question. It was certainly a question I never asked of Jordan. I never considered it was a possibility. In hindsight, I would go back and ask that question now if I had a time machine and could do that, because I now recognize signs that at the time I didn't realize might be a risk factor. This is a question I've asked to ask several times though, since Jordan's death through the work that I now do. And it's not an easy question to ask. It gets easier if you have to ask it more frequently. But how do you ask someone? Are you thinking of ending your own life? Well, imagine you've had a conversation with someone and they say that you know, I've been really struggling to sleep, Steve, um, for two or three weeks now. I'm just not sleeping at all. Um, I started to drink uh, a little bit more each night. I'm kind of having two or three beers or glasses of wine and just my mood, you know, just kind of hate myself. I just really, really, I'm just not feeling good. I just feel hopeless. Just imagine that conversation. And your response might be at that stage to say, okay, Steve, thank you for sharing that with me. You know, sometimes when people are really struggling to sleep, and that can be a real issue um, over weeks, it's going to affect the way you think and behave. And they're drinking to try and manage manage that and, and, and starting to feel that sense of hopelessness, you know, sometimes they consider suicide. I need to ask you, are you considering that as an option? And that's really how you ask it. And I think if the answer to that question is yes, you've got to ask, well, Steve, do you have a plan? Can I ask you, do you know how you're gonna do this and where you're going to do it? Because once you know that information, you know how quickly you need to act or what support you might need to provide in, or what information you might need to give to the emergency services. And at that point, I think it's about reassuring them that you will stay with them, 
and support them. And also acknowledge that suicide is an option. And for many people, this is a very strange statement. Um, and it does come from the training from the Samaritans here in the UK. Because at the moment, you're having this conversation, suicide is a solution, a rational solution to that person escaping the sense of entrapment that they have. It may seem completely irrational to us, but at that moment, it is a solution. And if you try and take that solution away from somebody by saying something like, you know, don't be silly, you don't want to do anything, you know, like that, that could cause more anxiety and pressure. So I think it's about, in that case, recognizing that, yes, Steve, I recognize that suicide is an option for you, but there's also another option, isn't there? And that is staying alive. Do you have to make that decision right now? And until the emergency services arrive, it's about just exploring options to keep them safe, keep them alive. And that could be someone else they could talk to, maybe on the phone. That could be distraction techniques like music or photographs, or shall we just go for a walk? Anything just to keep them safe during that period of time. Now, this whole conversation around suicide, and we've talked a little bit about stigma, um, is against a backdrop of many myths that there are about suicide. And I just wanted to share just some of these on, on the screen with you now. And one of those myths is that people who talk about serious uh, suicide aren't serious and actually won't, won't go through with that particular act. And I think we have to be really careful about that, particularly if someone has had multiple attempts to end their own life. I think we have to take every single case um, you know, really seriously there because the evidence has suggested that, that, of course, people who do talk about it often are very serious. One of the biggest myths is talking about suicide will plant the seed in that person's mind. And this is one of the, the reasons why a lot of people feel it's not appropriate to, to talk about suicide and mention it or ask the question even. Um, all the evidence um, suggests that if you ask someone if they're considering suicide, you are more likely to save a life than risk a life in that situation. That person feels less trapped. They feel listened to. In many cases, they are quite relieved to be able to have been asked that question and be able to uh, respond um, as well, it was something they felt they couldn't talk about before. Again, another myth is that people who um, talk about suicide are attention seeking. Um, and again, uh, it, it's, it's really important to understand that um, it may be a call for help, um, which is perfectly legitimate. So it's not just about seeking attention, it could be that this person just really does want to be helped. And one of the things we know from the evidence of many, many suicide survivors is that the majority of them do not want to die. They simply want to escape from the pain and that sense of entrapment that they're in. So by talking about it themselves, they are invariably looking for um, help and support. Um, one of the other myths, of course, is if a person is serious about suicide, there's, there's nothing you can do. Um, and again, hopefully through um, some of the points I've raised today, that myth has been dispelled. We know again with the right interventions in place right up until the last moment, it is possible to prevent somebody dying by suicide. One of the other myths of course, is you have to be mentally ill to consider suicide. Although we know that the majority of suicides are as a result of poor mental health. Not all suicides are. They can be down to other issues from physical pain, as I've mentioned, to a sense of entrapment. Um, and again, this might seem an odd comment to make, but often people who do end their own lives are in a very rational state of mind and have considered this and thought it through very carefully and logically. So it's another myth to advise, uh, to avoid. And once again, I've just covered this a moment ago, but people who are suicidal want to die. Uh, again, the evidence is no, they want to remove themselves from the pain that they're experiencing. So some thoughts around opening up the conversation and myths around suicide. And just in, in closing, before we open up and um, to, to any questions that may be, 
Our work at the Jordan Legacy is very much, as I mentioned at the beginning, about how do we move toward a zero suicide society? And this is all about two things really. One is what should be done within our workplaces um, and our communities, and then being realistic and saying what can be done. And I think there is a difference there. There are lots of things that should be done. It's not always possible to do them, but, but it's important to explore that within a community or a workplace and ask those two questions. We work at the Jordan Legacy within four key areas for our zero suicide strategy. The first of those are the community solutions, where we believe fundamentally that we can all make a difference in our communities through our schools and colleges and universities by having more open conversations around suicide in our educational centres. In the UK, you may be familiar with uh, some of the news if you've seen this, with uh, the three dads walking very famously raising awareness about having suicide and suicide conversations included on the school curriculum here in the UK. It's been a very high profile campaign from three fathers who have lost their daughters to suicide. If we talk to our local business chambers of commerce, to small businesses about what are they doing in terms of interventions and suicide prevention and conversations around suicide, from professional associations and industry bodies to community groups and sports clubs, both professional and amateur, to going out into known hotspots for suicide as communities and putting out maybe care bags and messages of support on bridges and other places. And in our everyday lives, maybe just being more kinder and more considerate to people. From a community, there's lots of things we, we can do. And it's the kind of work the Jordan Legacy does in terms of talking to these different groups of people. We can all learn skills. There are many free online training resources on how to have a conversation with someone who's struggling with their mental health or considering suicide. I think training is absolutely fundamental to us all. We often talk about first aid training, physical first aid training. We see health manuals within organizations, uh, health and safety manuals. Very rarely do they ever include mental health. We need to start addressing that. We need to make sure that mental health is as high on the agenda as physical health. You know, you're more likely to be required to support somebody with a mental health problem than a physical injury in your life. And it makes sense to ensure that we are all aware of how we would support someone in that situation. One of the other areas that we work in with the Jordan Legacy is in the design out community. And this is about taking a design thinking process around all the steps that lead up to somebody taking their own life. And that includes restricting access to means. And it's one of the reasons why we talk to those organizations that design outdoor spaces or buildings and bridges and how they can put in place future designs to mitigate the risk. But it's also about your own business policies within organizations and processes, such as how do you have difficult conversations where maybe you have to have a disciplinary conversation with an employee or make them redundant? What are the safeguarding processes, the do no harm policies that you have in place there? So we will talk with design schools and uh, colleges and uh, government planning departments around what are they doing to future proof and mitigate the risk around suicide? Are we designing out the capability or are we just putting measures in place on existing um, structures to stop people ending their own lives, really important. Workplace, of course, we all spend most of our time at work and it's a really important area for us at the Jordan Legacy. And we firmly believe that the organizational culture shapes employee well-being. We know that businesses need to recognize that there is a business case for looking after our employees and supporting their well-being. It's proven through the reports and annual reports from Deloitte, the accountancy firm here in the UK, who provide an annual report that for every one pound spent on employee well-being, there is a five to six pounds generated back to the business in profits due to having a thriving, mentally healthy and psychologically safe workplace. So we need managers to become better at developing their soft people management skills. Uh, and their EQ skills. We need 
more robust employee well-being strategies and policies in place covering all aspects of physical and mental health. We need better understanding of individual needs, particularly for those people that are working remotely, a legacy of the COVID pandemic. And maybe what we need to do is avoid actually governments having to put legislative compliance in place to make companies look after their employees. Maybe we just need morally to do things much better for our employees. We also need to have better signposting within our organizations and our institutions um, as to where people can get support and help from employee assistance programs to other support. And we also need to involve our employees and people within our organizations to help us create our well-being strategies and not always have it come from a human resources department or senior management. And importantly, we need to review all company procedures, policies, as I mentioned before, that may in some cases cause a risk to somebody's mental well-being and ultimately lead to a suicide risk. The fourth area we work on is around life-saving systems, digital and human. And this is all about looking at the technology that is available to us at the moment. And some of this may be within your organizations or within the universities. Um, everything from data analysis and augmented intelligence solutions that can reduce the risk of suicide from tracking devices that are being used to monitor whether people are climbing onto construction sites and building sites that maybe intend to harm themselves. We need to be much better uh, as a society in our search engines and social media um, platforms. And we again have had some very high profile cases here in the UK in recent weeks about the harm social media content has had on young people's lives. But we also need to look at what are the transferable tools that actually come from other industries that could be used to help prevent suicide. And as a, an example, in the construction industry, they will use beacons to monitor whether people are climbing on scaffolding on a construction site with an intent to do damage. Well, that same beacon can actually be used to monitor whether people are climbing up there with the intent to end their own lives and monitor any unusual behavior. So what are the transferable tools? So these are the four areas that we particularly focus on. And this all links to establishing what we would say is a zero suicide framework within each of those four areas. And if you were to establish a zero suicide framework within your organization or your group, what would you do? Well, you'd have a clear vision and objectives as what why you were doing this. You'd agree roles and tasks and who will meet regularly to discuss this suicide uh, zero suicide framework. Um, you would look and say, how does this framework align with our other mental health well-being initiatives and whether a budget is required for training and materials and posters. You'd review all your existing health and safety policies from a do no harm perspective, as I mentioned before. And you would probably involve anyone with an indirect or direct experience of mental health issues or suicide in helping you establish this framework. People with lived experience have a huge amount to offer. And you'd make sure that training was provided on your zero suicide philosophy and the organization or group or school and programs expectations uh, as far as that philosophy is concerned. And you'd review that zero suicide framework and be prepared to challenge anything that maybe isn't working as well as it should do against a possible risk of suicide. You would treat suicide as you would treat achieving any other goal in your organization and have a process to mitigate the risk. The difference here, this is not about performance or academic qualification. This is about saving lives and having a process in place to do that. So thank you for listening today. Um, I hope that's, that's, that's been useful. The message is that, yes, we must open up the conversation, but we must create more hope through taking action as well, which is really important. So Moyo, thank you for inviting me along uh, today. I will stop sharing the, the screen now. And um, if, if anyone, uh, I don't know if some questions have come in on the chat, Moyu, if you've been able to keep a look on that, but very happy to answer any questions.